Hey there, everybody. I'm Carson Grubaugh, uh, co-author and co-illustrator of Strange Death of Alex Raymond, which will be coming out soon, August. Yeah, this is Sean Robinson. Hello. The Various sundry enterprises and uh, publisher of Strange Death of Alex Raymond. Um, and with us today is the legendary Uncanny Omar from the Near Mint Condition podcast. Thank you guys uh, for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah. It's awesome. Thanks Thank so much, Omar. So we're, we're doing this special episode with Omar today. Uh, and I want to explain a bit why. We're going to be talking about um, the first Berserk Deluxe Edition book by Kentaro Miura. Um, this is a book, I've, I've had some of my students tell me about this over the years and they showed me art and I thought, mm, it's just one of those books where like they just keep leveling up to fight the next big bad guy kind of manga books. And so I always said, you know, those look cool, but I'm not that interested in reading them. Then I went uh, into a Barnes and Noble and I saw these, now that I went and got them all, haven't read them all yet, but I saw the production of the books. And anytime a book looks like that, I said, man, someone really thinks this is good to do a production like this. So now I'm more interested in and then I saw Omar do his like top 10 comics of all time. And I'm like vibing with every other choice you have. And then you're like, Berserk is my one. And I was like, oh man, okay, I got to take this book more seriously. So I wanted to do this book on the channel. And I think a week before we were going to shoot the video, video, Miura died, which was just like, uh, you could tell the response on the internet is, is tragic. And so I felt like it would be best to have a longtime fan who's like, you know, spreading the gospel on this episode um, so we could make it properly like respectful to that fact. So that that's why I really wanted to do this book was largely because of you. And I, I'm so grateful that you're here. So I think at first we would just love if you could tell people, you know, why, why is this book like you know what's the kind of first impression that you get in like this volume that we're going to look at and then why do, you first think, why do you think people yeah. should stick around with it mm -hmm. oh man um, i have a long history with berserk it's um it, it it's been part of my life for decades now uh, while i watched it in 1998 there was a 25 episode 1990 it came out in 1997 in japan originally uh series and uh my friend and I, back in the day when we used to go to conventions and have leg copies of things, um, we found a copy of, of this on VHS. We brought it home and we we binge watched it kind of like people do now with Netflix in one night. And I couldn't like it ends in for anybody that's watched it. And I don't, I'm not going to spoil it, but it ends in probably one of the biggest cliffhangers in TV history. It's. So uh, fast forward some time and then the uh, video game came out on the Dreamcast, which was so different. And I was like, what's going on? Where are all these other characters? Who's this chick? And then um, in 2003, Dark Horse was kind enough. I was uh, writing articles or I'm sorry, uh, reviewing manga for a magazine. Can't remember the name of the magazine now. Uh, and AOL had uh, their own little review site. So this was I got an early copy of this. They were like uh, they reached out to me and they were asking me if this was DMP when DMP was doing it, if I would be interested in reviewing the first volume of Berserk. And I'm like, oh my God, yes, please. Um, of course. So I reviewed it and it's not until you get to volume 13 that you find out what happens after the events of the 25th episode of that 1997 series I was talking about. Whew, and it's a ride. So you were like chasing what happened after that cliffhanger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when Finally, volume 13 comes. I'm like, oh, that, oh my gosh, that's how they do it. Uh, volume 14 came out and they were pumping these out four times a year to get you, you know, caught up. Um, and what people didn't realize here in America, as these were coming out, you know, they were selling okay. They weren't selling great, but no matter where I had with them and that I had a podcast, I would always talk about how great the series was and what, what, what draws me to it. So um in japan he took you know a long time to make these books i think it started in 19 when was it 1989 yeah. yeah and he would take you know not breaks but just it takes a long time especially when you get to look at the artwork um and he was young drawing this stuff too which is insane um so 
fast forward some years, I have a YouTube channel called Near Mint Condition. And uh, one of the contacts at Dark Horse still had my information from when I used to do reviews of books and noticed that I was, she asked if this is the same Omar that used to uh, do reviews of manga for a magazine. I'm like, yeah, it is. And then she said, would you be interested in doing an advanced overview of this book? And man, I'm not going to lie. I think I may have shed a tear. I'm like, oh my God, yes, <laughs> please. Um, and I, uh, Berserk meant so much to me. Like I swore off doing reviews of books on my channel for so long uh, because I was just tired of, you know, you get to do reviews of books and you can only say so much about these books. But I don't know. I, I think when Berserk 38 came out, it was four years of me waiting for that book. I decided, you know what? I think I'm going to do a review because it's Berserk. And uh, yeah, I did. And then I started doing reviews of other books. And I was like, well, maybe I did miss doing it. Um, but it's funny that Carson said that he, he kind of um, thought it was one of these well, there's always a bigger fish kind of stories, right? Like Dragon Ball Z, uh, you go from Frieza to Cell, from Cell to the Boo Saga. There's always a bigger bad guy. And, hey, and then you're like, wait a minute, but this guy can destroy a planet with his one finger. How can you be more, <laughs> how can you get stronger than that? And honestly, there is a beauty to Berserk that I wanted to keep from people. I wanted them to find for themselves. So that's the way I sold it. And I don't know if that's just my general audience or mm, the audience as a whole that's looking for something that's just, you know, over the top violence or very masculine characters fighting each other. But that's not really what Berserk is about. Yeah, yeah, of course it, it is. It's the top layer, right? This guy fighting giant demons and you're like, oh, my God, the artwork, the, the detail. But it's probably one of the most human stories you ever um you can never read especially the more you get further down the road it's 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 wonderful it's awesome and it's it's heartbreaking and it's lonely and it will make you have all these weird feelings like so, almost feeling dirty but you're like well okay I, that does make me feel wrong in a weird way but i kind of want to find out what happens next and it's a complexity of all that that makes berserk such a beautiful story to me because i mean that in a way that's the way life is right like you have ups and downs. You're lonely a lot of the time. And then you have, you know, you meet friends, they go away, you meet a, uh, brand new friends. And I don't know, there's a lot of things in this book that I find beautiful, but I always try to keep that on, on the, on just, I, I, I keep that away from my videos and I just show the artwork. I'm like, look at this guy with a giant sword. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah, it is. But, but see, I would, I, what part of what sold me is the way you talked about it like oh this does have more depth it does have more humanity because when my students are showing it to me i'm seeing and i know the, the new fist of the north star hardcover just came mm -hmm. out so that's something i want to look at too but that's kind of the and i've never finished that series either because it had that always a bigger fish thing and it's like beautiful yeah. art, beautiful artwork but i said it looks like a fist of the north star kind of thing so the way that you talk about it is what sold me on it um and i, I you know i've only really looked at this first volume and formed my opinion on that so it still feels a little bit like that to me but I, like i'm excited you know i as, as soon as he did die i was like oh my god these things are going to disappear and i ran out we have a we have a store called second and charles here in alabama oh, love those places oh my god they're so good and that was another thing I, I would go to second and Charles and they just have stacks of berserk. So it's like, man, this is huge. And I was like, I, Amazon's out, but I got to run to second and Charles and just <laughs> grab. And so I was able to get all of the ones that are out so far. So but it's interesting that you're, you're identifying the sort of cultural context for the earlier uh, chapters of it, like 1989, when it first comes out, that was sort of in the air. I mean, you know, you, you have that in the Japanese um, young men's magazines that yeah. were popular at the time. Um, and it, it seems to me that uh, there's a lot of cross pollination with the uh, American culture at the time. You think about like wrestling, you know, WWF is sort of um, a touchstone in the sense of, um, I mean, I always thought about it as like a uh, basically like operatic soap operas for men. 
Uh, you take in the same sense that a soap opera exaggerates <laughs> all the things that women are stereotypically interested in, uh, you know, wrestling, heavy metal, uh, as, as a music genre, those things are sort of like exaggerating the things that are, you know, young men ha find appealing or interesting. And, and that's definitely like, I mean, at least the, 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 the foundational early chapters, um, it seems like he really is leaning into that uh, influence. I mean, I was not shocked at all to find out that he started out at 18 years old as an assistant to uh, Burunson on, um, on Fist of the North Star. Uh, because it, it it definitely seems like at least you could sort of from one lens you could see it as like a um, fist of the North Star in a fantasy context. Yeah, um, one one hundred percent. Actually, I just uh, we're doing an overview of the fist of the North Star. You know, it is an inspiration for Berserk, of course, uh, visually the right. way that the, the the main character looks. But uh, th that's interesting that you mentioned the fascination with raw wrestling because um, we used to have I don't. I'm pretty sure you guys remember the muscle men that oh, yeah. used to come out, like the little plastic, the uh, little toys, uh -huh. uh, yeah. capsule, capsule toys here in America. Uh, so that that's based on the uh, Kina, uh, um, what is it, Kini, Kinikuman, the, the the wrestlers in Japan. So they've always had this huge fascination with people that wear masks uh, and, and just fighting in, inside of a ring. Super muscular guys, and that series you know, that predates Fist of the North Star. And that's probably the one that a lot of people think of when they think of the very first, like, <laughs> young man magazine, like a, a magazine that shows you, like, this is the perfection of man, which right. is super muscular guys fighting each other. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad you brought argue. that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but... So, uh, yeah, so let's like Omar. You had I had avoided this page to show, but you asked me to show this. I, one. I, okay. So let's because this is this is uh, and hopefully this is going to work for the recording this time with three people. Hopefully I can spotlight this on the recording. Uh, but this is exactly like that super, and this is why I felt like I was a little bit scared to talk about this book right after he passed because I kind of have to make fun of the phallic imagery and the machismo in the book a, a little bit you know that mm -hmm. that was something i noted as i read so anyways th this like sums up everything you're talking about with the the young man's machismo right so i'm i'm, in, I'm curious why why you had me tag this one in specific okay so this page and i thought about i'm like well maybe we shouldn't talk about it because it's, it's <laughs> so different right because immediately when people look at this book they're like okay this guy He's really weird. He's a sup super muscular guy with a metal arm and he's having sex with demons. But the reason I asked you to show this is because it's very reminiscent of like, he's very inspired, yes, by a lot of the Japanese manga that was out at the time, but also a lot of different artwork. So this to me, like, it's like H, uh, HR uh, uh, Geiger, right? Yeah. Like yeah. it looks like his xenomorph. Even yeah. almost the pose of the, 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 the creature, the head, the tongue, like this yeah. immediately speaks like inspiration from something outside of the of his of the usual realm of manga creators. I, I, I love it. Right. Because we're talking 1989. Yeah. So this is before Alien 3. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a it's a hell of a way to open a book. But yeah. Immediately, so immediately. different. Yeah. So different than than the rest of the book. Because never, I'm, never again does this ever happen where he's, you know, your main character is, I, I'm sure, I, I wish I, I, I could have uh, seen people ask him about this, if he ever regretted opening the book like this. Well, because it, it is, it was going. It is, it was a bit of like a confirmation of my fears like oh come on man like you're just pounding it out with the demon, and then you immediately goes to like, uh, like blow her hat off basically exactly <laughs> I, th I thought oh man like i i personally don't really like things that just revel in grotesque i don't mind grotesque if it has a point but it immediately opened the book for me like oh come on man he pushes um, it so far though i mean it, you know that that's the other fist of the north star touch point for me is that you know burinson and fist of the north star is not just like we're gonna fight with our fists he's like I'm going to hit you in a special part and your body's going to explode. And every yeah. time I do this trick, because you guys like that, right? You liked it when his body exploded? Okay, check us out. This time, it's really going to explode. This is just like, yep, that's right. There it is. 
Here it is. No, he's actually he's doing it. It's not just like sexy demon. It's not just like uh, you know provocative demon is tempting me. It's like she changed into a demon while we were doing it. Yeah, um, and there which it is. is also what th th that movie Species had that come out yet? No, that was that's no. a 1997 or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just have a bunch of pages then tagged. Some of them, like this one. Um, are more things that I want to look at when we get to scan. Sean, this is the yeah. one that we're going to recreate as well. Uh, but some some of these, um, I to me, when I look at this, this looks really poorly reproduced and we'll look at it. So that's something else, Omar. I, like, I, I have peaked at the later volumes. I haven't read them, but the reproduction quality gets better and better th through these deluxe mm -hmm. volumes. Um, I wonder, like, as a longtime fan like is that something that doesn't register to you at all or do you see the like like there's there's another page i don't know where it's at but there's some other images where it seems like more quality reproduced are you used to seeing this this way have you seen better reproductions in older volumes so the reproductions that um that were that i've had issues with is the <sighs> Let me see. So for the masters that they use for the original one, it doesn't happen until I think volume two. It looks like the scans are really light. Hmm. So like the lighter tones are super light. So much so that, I don't know, it just kind of threw the images off. Right. But that's probably to do with whatever masters that Dark Horse, or I'm sorry, DMP had at the time. And all they did was just blow it up. They didn't go back and remaster it um but that's that's the only issue that i remember noticing okay it's also, that's possible, just a... it's also possible these first few chapters were done for a different magazine than the full run uh was so it's also possible they had issues with getting the negative or you know just just sort of basic. yeah um you know yeah and it's stuff that over time uh like in flipping through the volumes yeah it it immediately gets better, but it's always something that, you know, that's part of what we're interested in on this channel. Okay, so I'm gonna flip, I'm gonna skip past the images I have tagged that I have pulled up on screen. Um, one thing I'm curious about going forward is I noticed, A, there's a lot of that machismo, and um, I don't know, I don't know if I want this spoiled for me or not, but there's okay. a lot of I don't I don't know how I feel about this, but it's it's such a strong impression I get throughout the book. Uh, there's a lot of the machismo, and some of them I'll I'll point out where the weapons seem very much representing genitalia, and the monsters are very like you said, H.R. Giger, like genitals all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also notice a lot of like panels like this, where there seems to be a lot of homoeroticism underneath it all. Um, and I can't tell if it's like, I, like I almost get the sense and I'll show later in the book that like, this is part of this character's story arc is maybe his struggle with homosexual feelings um, or like, I, I don't know, there's something underneath it. Well, you get this, like this little, like naked fairy that's always showing off its little butt. And it's like, I mean, it's like right in his crotch. Um, so I saw a lot of that throughout the book, and I'm I'm real curious. And we'll, as we get to a little later in the volume, I'll, are, I'll are show asking, more. Are you asking Omar if that pays off? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't want to spoil things. Uh, how yeah, do I, that's what I, I. Yeah. How do I word this? Um, I think there's definitely a lot of thought in most panels, right? Not every panel. But he is a true artist, and the more you keep reading, the more you'll see his art evolve. And I'm serious, by the, by the time, and we'll look at some of the things here, um, but by the time you get to volume two, I think the question that's going to pop up in your head is going to be how. How did he do this? How did he do this and publish it at, well, at the time it was monthly? Like, it was insane. The amount of detail that he puts... And, and where he places the figures on the panel is just amazing. Um, but yeah, there, there, there definitely is some foreshadowing. Okay. As far as there's like either, there's either like, 
and I mean, he break. There is a specific panel that I I picked out, uh, and when we get to it, I'll 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 explain why I picked it out. Okay. I, you know, I, I wanted to throw in something. I, I, when I was teaching high school, this was, uh, you know, I would occasionally go to like a library sale and I would buy all of the remainder uh, comics that, you know, I thought were visually interesting and I'd pop them on my shelf, sometimes not examine them very carefully. And uh, this is one that uh, I had a few volumes of it sitting on my shelf. I never read it at the time. Uh, <laughs> See, like, it's like Dragon Ball Z. It's fine. <laughs> it's exactly right. And uh, a couple kids were really spoke to them. And I never, you know, examined exactly why. But having looked at it now, I think, oh, <laughs> that was probably a fireable offense. My wife always would ask me, because she was a high school teacher and for 10 years. And she would always ask me, like, is this okay? And, and, and then sometimes part of me is like, hell yeah, that's okay. 13 year old Omar would have loved that in the classroom, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you might get in trouble. <laughs> I just like, uh, my partner's son just shut up. He's staying with us for a month and a half. And I was flipping through the book, getting ready for the episode. And I realized he was in the room. I was like, oh my God, what page is I on? <laughs> Cause he's only 10. Um, well, I didn't intend to look at this page, but I just flipped past it. This one's really well produced. Yeah. Um, and this is super blade of the immortal which is another one of the nice deluxes that yeah. they have coming out blade, blade is the top about, 10 for me i love blade. Five, about five years into the future right blade blade uh i think was 90 93 yeah uh, that 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 has a huge history with me too because that came out in american single issues like mm -hmm. a month after it came out and premiered in japan they had a big like uh, they had some kind of contract dark horse and yeah. the publishing company over there uh, this is a pretty cool panel. I, I love looking yeah. at Guts like this because he's so small right now. Look how small he is compared to how he <laughs> looks later on, right? Like when Mira really kicks it into the next gear. Yeah, it's like stuff like that. That's so cool. Um, oh, that one, that's one that I have pegged for because of the tone stuff. And you got the clouds, Sean. Yeah, clouds um, on very interesting to see the, the tutorial written by the assistant. Like, uh, Oh, we'll, we'll come back to that later. But uh, basically, yeah, um, uh, we will. Yeah, I don't want to. Well, yeah, we have a big that's that's one of my in terms of the art. That's the biggest thing I'm interested in is he's at Omar. You said his his style changes a bit later mm -hmm. on. He He's very I can feel him experimenting through this. And I love that. Like he's at, a, they, he's at a young age, right? When you're young and you've yeah. got all this energy and you're gung ho, you're like, oh, I can make it better. Let's spend a little more time. I mean, looking looking at this. Yeah, this is awesome. Okay, so yeah, but looking at a battle like this, even three volumes from here is so different. Like the art style that he takes, uh, looking at the detail that he does. Because um, trying to see, this is more of like sketchy art, right? It almost feels yeah. like it almost feels like this is his rough sketch of what the spread pages should look like instead of a finished product later on mm -hmm. yeah but man this is i don't know, uh, i love this page very uh john buscema conan to me oh, yeah. <laughs> conan all over i mean I, I i was wondering if uh if the if the early 80s schwarzenegger acted conan movie wouldn't have been a touchstone for him um i would say so i mean he was big into a lot of things and being especially young, with I, these like to me, this is so Dungeons and Dragons. Like, this is what I thought of as zombie for a long time. I didn't think about like the the Walking Dead type of Night of Living Dead zombie. I always thought of the fantasy where it's mm -hmm. like just a skeleton <laughs> with the armor and stuff like that. The like army so of cool. darkness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna say a lot. A lot of the the design work for this first uh, for this first uh, volume is is uh, sort of ready made for animation. Um, I think about some of the things that were popular, you know, leading up to this, like a record of Lodos War, um, mm -hmm. had some uh, success as a as an OVA series where they were putting them out, you know, a couple months separated so they could get a little higher production standard and um, selling directly to fans. Uh, things like that, where the sort of Japanese uh, fantasy context was a little more animation based, and uh, I, I picked out at least one panel from this sequence right here. That was just super reminiscent of an uh, animation effect. Um, yeah, I have that. I have that pulled up in Photoshop. Um, I, I'd be curious to take take a look at that. Um, but yeah, the the 
in terms of the animation look, uh, I guess what I mean by that is that the he's very, very on model at all times. He's designed a face that's very distinctive that can be seen from all angles. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you wonder if he's already developed the model sheet for it. Um, you know, he'll he'll vary the rendering, obviously, in the expression, but the but the the design is there from the very beginning. At least, you know, if he's going to modify it, he hasn't modified it for the first couple hundred pages. Um, and then also the use of um, backgrounds and like implied uh, parallax motion when you'll see um, in some sequences, you'll see a clear delineation between the background and the middle ground yes. and the foreground. And you'll see the foreground shift on top of those other elements. It's, you know, almost anticipating the, the uh, adaptation that might be on the way. Um, Smart. <laughs> yeah. And like the hairstyle is so just, I got to admit, I go back and forth on the hair, like where it's just the one row that's hanging down so <laughs> flat, but it is so distinctive. Right. And I think Sean, that's part of what you're talking about is yeah. there's just, it's, it's a little weird, but it's so distinctive that like you immediately, like that's one of the first kind of icons of the book I had in my mind was that weird. But he can be distinguished. He does. He yeah. can be distinguished from any other character with fairly, um, you know, it the the animation doesn't some animation version of it doesn't necessarily have have to have a lot of fidelity to the original image in order to still be distinctively the character. You're designing the hair in order to be seen on a you know a cell <laughs> or or from a distance you know in the in the comic and you can still identify him. Is this the first giant sword, Omar? I mean, Cl Cloud in Final Fantasy is the sort of, you know, 1995. Yeah, I, I think this is the very first, I mean, uh, historically, no, right? But <laughs> horse killers have been around for a while. But um, I think this was the very first big sword that inspired lots of characters with giant swords. Right. And that's unlike that's Cloud, this guy actually looks like he can carry it. <laughs> <laughs> Cloud looks like he's going to pass out on the way to the grocery store. Come on, man. Cloud <laughs> really? <laughs> like, yes, but this is, uh, you know, and of course, huge, huge influence on the whole Dark Souls and um, Bloodborne, all those right. series of video games. It's interesting to see that panel on page, uh, what is that, 206? How it, uh, His lips down at the very bottom corner it looks very it looks different it doesn't look like mura's style the eyes big just so looks you different. think maybe this was an assistant i don't even know if he had assistants back then. <laughs> i think or it was just, just exploring just different yeah yeah just different a young, to render young mira so yeah. talking about the big sword this is i tagged this page because this is one of the ones that like reading this book i did find it kind of humorously phallic at times I don't know if it's just a translation, but he's saying, see, it's not just a question of size. If you can't handle your weapon, it's more than baggage. And I don't know. I, I wonder, like that is, yeah, is I wonder I how much, to get the phallic read. I wonder how much of that is the original translation and how much of that they had, you know, they took liberties with uh, the okay. MP did. Because a lot of the time what they did uh back then especially when they were translating manga and it kind of it's gotten a lot better since then but they would add what they thought would be something that young american males would like to see in a book like oh pop culture references that you know are not in the original book like at all they would add things like that and i think that was that was a publisher's um uh, that, that was all the publisher so this could be them like it, putting, it could be or putting uh, some dick jokes in there. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Come on, 13 year old kid reading and going, ah, this guy's awesome. He's talking about his penis. Yeah, that's it was it was hard for me. So it, it's kind of it's a bummer if they're doing that because it did skew some of this thing. That or it very about. well be could be in the original. We, it we it seems thematic thematically relevant to me basically mm -hmm. well i mean you know it, this, this, this is the sort of the general idea of of the idea of a cultural um you know something that's just in the air i mean fighting is you know related to other stuff and if you're an adolescent you only want to fight and yeah. then all of a sudden you discover the other sex and uh, you know there's something else that's uh maybe more interesting to you um well it's not but, like japan doesn't have those big dick wooden parades and stuff you right know, they do. exactly uh will, will you go back to 207 just for a second i, I yeah. want to um 
it, uh, one of the things I was thought was remarkable about this book, um, and so like what we keep on saying, so young, uh, his his artwork is very very durable. Uh, he has made this to be seen at two different sizes. Uh, this is sort of the perennial manga problem. If you're the manga artist working for reproduction, you're working for both the magazine that's going to be producing your book, you know, monthly or <laughs> weekly or um, bi-monthly, uh, which is going to be like a seven by ten uh, size approximately, uh, you know, uh, fairly large compared to the Tonkaban or Tonkaban or I'm going to please don't don't at me uh, <laughs> for, format, which is fairly small. Uh, you look at an image like this and look at his cape and the way he's designed the folds of the cape. You got action lines and hatching on the cape that make that a very distinctive half black, half white uh, area that's carried solely by these big chunks of black and a little bit of feathering. You've got um, texture happening on the ground and on the wall there, but the texture is, is reinforced. Uh, you've got the medium sized pen lines and then it's reinforced by these um, areas of full black underneath there. And the same thing with the pseudo armor there, you've got uh, reinforcement of the finer sort of texture lines with those thicker uh, lines right there. And then that medium tone on top that's etched to give you highlights. All of those things are fairly durable in the sense that you can look at them at different sizes and they still read. Um, that, that is a trick to pull off. And it's fairly, you know, surprising to me that somebody could do that. You know, I mean, that's what monthly production gets you. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it, it's a trick to make a page that's viewable at different sizes like that. Um, and doesn't sort of collapse in on itself when it's reproduced really small. Yeah, and, and then you see it larger too, and you don't feel like you're like some of some of the stuff that I'm seeing reproduced larger from Japan that's intended to be seen smaller, and then it blows up, and it's like mm, you know, like I'd rather read this small, but you know, this one I could see it like twice the size of this book, which is closer to uh, it's larger than an, an American production. Um, and I would still like to see it like twice as big, you know, so yeah, it's, it's really beautiful, intricate art. And I see why all my students, you know, they all come to me and they're like, oh my God, you like cross that. Like every time I do the lesson in cross hatching, they're, <laughs> they're like, oh, you got to read Berserk. Uh, we'll get to this one later. I just found the tone. This looks so, and I don't know if it's the reproduction or how he did the tone. We'll talk about more, but know, yeah. it looks like um, when I was in junior high, like in the early 90s, where you'd make um, art like this on the computer, and then you print it out, like something about the way, and yeah, this is, how do, Omar, how do you pronounce this? The Baylet? Baylet. Mm -hmm. Baylet. Yeah, this is a very bizarre, distinctive looking thing. <laughs> it's um, creepy. It, yeah. It's got an uncanny quality to it. Yeah, we'll talk about it, but it's it's with tone layering, Carson. Um uh, I, I got up in on that image there, and uh, it's a, it created by offsetting two pieces of tone uh, slightly, and the angle has changed just a little bit to create an intentional moire pattern, uh, just slight. It gives it like a vibrational quality to it that's, uh, that's pretty it just, interesting. It looks digitally it looks digitally done to me, which I found odd, but it's part of what I really like and when we go to the scans his experimentation with how to pull off these effects like the, the way he does this thing changes throughout throughout the book um you know so it's like it's interesting to watch him same thing with this guy here his approach to to the the bear in here yeah I, I, I can see what you're talking about so it does yeah. it would just be crazy because then we're looking at what year 1990 mm-hmm with, was that when these would be out okay yeah 1990 90 maybe maybe early 91 was there any anything no it, it's it's not I mean, it's all hand drawn yeah it's, it's not it's yeah. not digital it's done it, it, it will show that i'll show you that when we get to the <clears> tutorial uh, that i scanned uh, gives you a little bit of info on that but yeah the tone is offset They're essentially layering the tone um together uh to give it that vibrational quality this is another one I tagged as just like the young man kind of phallic image <laughs> talking about his master sword there. Uh, I thought that was funny. The all, I know there's just so many of them where the weaponry lined up right to the crotch. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, I just... how else are you going to hold a weapon, though? Yeah. I mean, are you even holding a weapon if you're not holding it next to your crotch? <laughs> I don't know. So that's why I felt bad because, like, maybe I was coming into this. It put me in the 13-year-old mindset, like these things right here. Um, I felt bad treating it flippantly. But it, never, there is. I've never noticed that. Wow. <laughs> there, There is a payoff to to me seeing all of that because at first I thought it was very machismo but then in my mind the machismo gets undermined coming up here soon um, this is another one with all the weird moray patterns I want to take mm -hmm. a closer look at because it sometimes I see more way and I think oh that's ugly but this one got a cool lighting effect to totally on purpose yeah 100 yeah. percent on purpose and that's interesting because like the the sort of digital area that we've entered moire is a sign that you've done something wrong but uh, in, in this particular era of toning, um, that was just one ex effect that you could exploit. Uh, and it definitely gives it a kind of vibrancy. Um, yeah, and this is like, it, it actually gets, there's all these holes in the architecture of the window. Right. And it actually, I know he's got the actual light up there from the holes in the window, yeah. but it gets that glow of like, the, there's light shooting out of here, which I thought was, you know, really, interesting i don't think i like it as much down here but up there it's a really beautiful effect i so i'd we'll, actually yeah go ahead we'll look at that one closer this is another one i just wanted to look at because he does change how he handles this character's body the way he does the mm -hmm. toning on this monster like here it looks like ink splatter was scratching and then almost immediately it's like this weird noise tone with scratching right. rather than an ink splatter and then, um, oh, I wanted to look at this to uh, talk about halftone reproduction. This is another, by the way, a gigantic genital. I mean, there's two, like this monster is just a big dick and balls. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. I, that, that, one, that one's a little easier to tell than the guy with the giant armor. Amazing. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Oh, oh, Mark, a, you know, if these seg uh, segments were reproduced in color when it was uh, so I was going to I was going to say uh, some of them were reproduced in color and they decided to go uh, with these. What, what is this? Uh, it's like a whitewash yeah. tone and yeah. to make it cheaper and more, you know, because if they had done the colors, I think they were talking about maybe increasing the price ten dollars. Right. But mm -hmm. yeah, they decided to go with black and white instead. So that's why it probably looks a little off. And you can usually tell when they were done. Now, there's not that many chapters that lead in with this, but. No. It, yeah, yeah it's it gets, that, that it was gets a, murky. Th that was a sign, uh, you know, that, of the popularity of the serial, because, of course, the, the magazine that they would have been serialized in um, would assign color chapters to the yeah. artists who were getting the best ratings you know all these magazines were incredibly efficient at getting an idea of what their audience expected and wanted and uh you know they'd have uh, surveys with rewards every every week or every month or whatever however often the issues came out and so when you see these uh, color inserts it's a sign that the serial was fairly popular within the magazine it was in so would this have been in color too then this intro yeah, That's yeah. Right. okay yeah that would be way cooler with the fire and stuff right and, and part of the grayscale reproduction aspect of it is, of course, if you're painting something for color, uh, you're not necessarily using value in the same way as you're painting something in black and white. So that muddiness is oftentimes just because somebody's using their colors to offset objects from each other or to give contrast. And then you just pop it into grayscale. It's not the same thing as painting something in grayscale. And we'll do, grayscale. I have pulled up an image, we'll do that too in Photoshop too. We'll, put it black and white and do a half tone on it so people yeah. can see what that's about um here again we got this baron character with a much more open like pattern on him like i i think it's it's cool to watch him struggle with that that monster throughout because it starts off really dark and we like here it's really dark it's not i don't know if it reproduced better in japan but it doesn't appear to reproduce very well it's a very muddy image and pretty quickly he opens up to like this more open toning pattern on it that seems to reproduce better it's bigger he also flips a lot which is odd to me like on one page changing the texture kind of depending on how far away the monster is or is not um so it was interesting to follow that i thought 
he had got a little bit better handling on the baylet as well. It, it looked less artificial and computerized. So it's really cool to watch. Um, I, I did actually mentally, I know we always go back to Dave's work, but this feels a lot like Cerebus volume one too, where it's lighter and like Omar saying, you know, it gets like more serious as it goes. And, and a lot of people, when they talk about Cerebus kind of say, skip the first volume, right? Go to high society or something. And this had that same, I like that early phase of like the character is on his kind of, I, there seems to be some time jumps in here too, but the character's kind of adventuring in a way that maybe tames down later. I don't know in this series, but the artist is adventuring at the same time. So it works to me to have that opening book seem like more episodic, like here's an adventure, here's an adventure, here's an adventure. We haven't built this grand narrative yet. And, and that really allows the artist to, to play a lot. Um, here's another art artistic experiment. Oh, man. Like That's all brushwork, way less detail. Um, these big black and white brushy strokes. I don't see any pen on this page. Um, I really the Frank Miller Sin City face. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is so different. Preempting him though, I would think, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah this yeah. would be ninety. Yeah, ninety ninety one. This is um, this is like a this is giving me the JoJo Bizarre Adventure. Uh, yeah vibes a little bit but yeah that man it's 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 a a, a real you're you're absolutely right about the, the the shifting styles he's really trying out a lot of different things and i love it like i actually i really like this stuff um that page is cool this is by the way omar i know you like pun fun right good night pun fun oh love good night pun fun yeah right there like as soon as i turned this page i was like oh my god there's this big <laughs> pun pun thing and i love the mc escher like, oh yeah I was, thinking, I was thinking piranesi yeah it's beautiful um, stuff the, i was the, uh i always uh see this scene with the gut and i think i had you pick out the page uh with the god hand because that always reminds me of escher like this. yeah just the the big reveal right that he's looking for this bigger bad who who are these cats gosh they look horrific it's, it's yeah, so and I, creepy and awesome i love it yeah this was one of my favorite parts of the book and this is where the stuff that i started that i was like jokingly noticing i was reading this and showing it to my partner and i was like look at this dick joke look at this dick joke and then i got to hear and in this scene i started to that's where i started to wonder this character here, I get a pretty strong impression that Guts has a relationship with this character. I mean, they're obviously friends of some sort, mm -hmm. but there seems to be something more underlying their relationship. Um, and this character is presented as very, like, it, even though it's like this big buff character, there's something very feminine about this character to me and how they present him. And their relationship seems to have a sexual undertone to it. Um, and so all of the kind of big phallic imagery and like this, this chick here has like a little penis on her, her design of her thing. And th there's a lot of genital imagery in the monsters, which is pretty typical for monsters. But there seemed to start to be a bit of a more of a thematic reason for that. And I don't know, I'm just curious as I, and again, I don't know if I want that spoiled or not, but. I'm curious to see how that develops. And here it's just like the lips are very feminine. The eye is very, is this the God hand? Is that what you're calling this character? They call it Griffith. Okay, so uh, the God hand is, is all five of those characters. Okay, all five of them. Yeah, and he's he's calling him Griffith. Griffith. Yeah. And so, then there's if, something. Uh, if you go back to that page really quick, so I, th I can't remember where I read that he did get some inspiration for this from um, Barker's work. On the, Bite, yeah. The Zeno, yeah, Xenobites. I can kind of see that, uh, honestly, in, in, in some of the designs. And I can kind of see, I always think of the guy in the back, uh, I cannot remember his name, but um, he's the, yeah, like the Mars attack aliens. Guys yeah, for brain. sure. 
the brain head guy. But again, I, this... really, I really don't know how much, I mean, because I'm thinking Mars Attacks was what? Was it? It was early 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. Now, uh, the, the, the Tops cards, of course, came out in the 50s, so he could have very well drawn inspiration from that. I don't know. Or just brains in general. I mean, you know, that's the, that's the <laughs> okay, thing. Right. Bio, <laughs> also, bio, <forgot> or, it. <laughs> yeah, bioorganic uh, forms. I mean, if you've, you know, looked at a, you know, uh, body or, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I think a lot of the same kind of solutions come up over and over again. Um, the, the, I have the, I was gonna one, one more thing. I'm sorry. Uh, this yeah, scene definitely it. gave me different feelings than David Bowie walking around stairs and in labyrinth. This is a different. This is like a, a holy crap. I'm kind of. I'm scared. Yeah, I felt like I Creepy. like I I went from what felt like an episode. This is the point where I started to get like more interested. At, up until this point, where mm -hmm. he was fighting the Baron. I did still feel like, yeah, it's just going to be like the monster of the month kind of episodic thing. This, when they crack open reality with the bailet getting bloody and go here, I was like, oh, there's like a Lovecraft elder gods, <laughs> like uh, external and, and going into this, like where reality is flip flipping and it, it becomes extra dimensional, inth dimensional. And that, yeah, I got a bit of a chills when you're like, oh, you're encountering something big now. Um, so I am very excited to see. It seems obvious to me it's, well, because there's like a time jump in the back of the book. So it, it, and there seems to be history between these characters. So I'm, I'm curious now, like I'm hooked into the bigger story more. But also to me, this just looks like Batman. <laughs> like, uh I like Omar. I like your HR Giger though. I hadn't seen that, but that the ribbed structure on everything is very Giger. As yeah, well, yeah. I think um, he, you know, he he draws a lot of inspiration. I love it. I love when artists do this. Like I love when artists. Uh, now it's so much easier, right? Now we have the internet. He actually had to do research for this stuff. Either had a <laughs> Giger book or 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 watched aliens a lot was a big fan of clive barker and keep in mind the guy was like we were talking about 18 to draw influence from all of that is just insane and to draw this well at 18 <laughs> also not fair <laughs> yeah totally not <laughs> totally fair. not fair but talk about another potential influence um he's also a contemporary of um i don't know exactly how to pronounce his name but um uh Yukito uh, Kishiro, the guy who drew um, Gum or uh, Battle Angel Alita. Battle Angel Alita. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they would have been contemporaries of each other. Um, maybe it was started a little bit after this, but the, the previous two pages, Carson, those extreme expressions are definitely. Oh, uh, sorry. One more. One more. Um, one more page over there. The, the sort of teeth out gummy. Um, thing is, is is a very like feature of the bad guys of Alida. Um that's that's really interesting because I, I never I, I don't think I knew that because um he also did the guy that did Alita did something called uh Ash and Victor. Right. And Ash and Victor Fantastic. is like those pages we were looking at where it's nothing but he's doing just uh brushes. Right. But that would have been later. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. at, that was after Alita was over. Right. You're talking about the all brush like Frank Miller. Yeah, it, it was oh, it was okay. very similar to that art style. He took a different approach. Okay. Was, yeah. There's some intermediary that we're missing. Uh, somebody that they're you know they're both looking at, but it's it, it's yeah the high contrast style. Um, would, would you go back just a few more pages? Uh, well, well, I didn't I didn't tag this page, but oh. now that we're on it, the abstraction I love like this page is so cool to me. As soon as we flipped to it, sorry, I was like, oh my god, like oh, the yeah. weird the turning of the panels and. Just the the abstract placement of the black. I, I had to point that out. Um, going back to the big god hand page. Uh, no, it's okay. I, I won't find the exact thing, but um, it, several of the expressions are. Uh, you know, I I feel like they were probably looking at each other's work. Uh, Alida and and uh, and uh, Berserk here, or speaking to each other a little bit. That's a fantastic uh, action image right there with those oh, those uh, speed lines coming out from the back. I was going to say his speed lines are getting crazier and more intense. Yeah. Um, you get the multiple values there with the finer speed lines behind him. Um, and then those those chunkier ones 
as the primary directional ones and the torn look to the cloak there. You can see why they didn't want to translate the effects because, I mean, you know, I, I don't even, I can't even imagine what, how, what you'd have to pay to find a letterer who could, you know, do stuff They used, like that. I will say they used to, they used to. Um, and, and it's crazy because um, before 2000, before Tokyo, I always blame Tokyo Pop for this. Right. Uh, every, <laughs> every publisher of manga here in America would translate the sound effects within yeah. the panel. So they would have to get a letterer. And they get the best letterers in the business. If you were Torn Smith and you were running, yeah, Steve I was going to say Torn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, his, his wife is a fantastic letterer. They had Steve Olaf. I mean, you know, they they really knew how to find people who who could do it. But I mean, you, very very few hand letterers working in English now. I mean, presumably because the work has dried up. But yeah, the, there's just nothing there, and they can pump yeah. out so much more monthly if right. they don't have to bother with you know translating the letters. Yeah, I've forgotten well, how big Fento. I'm, I'm sorry, Griffith was at the beginning. How thick he is. Well, and he. It, it, okay, so this is where I started. He's calling him Griffith, and he knows him. Like he's yelling his name here, and then he just looked so like a pretty. Oh yeah. Pretty face, <laughs> and he's yelling Griffith, and they obviously kind of have what some relationship. Um like he's angry at him you know like none of that's explained there's this page where I, I don't know there's just some undercurrent between their relationship there that i started to think okay like maybe as it goes along like and i think let me see yeah here you go back and now you're meeting it's obviously this character as a younger person um, so this scene is where I started to think, okay, maybe what I thought was like this overly machismo kind of homophobic thing going on, like underlying it all actually becomes like a love story between these two guys. Um, Cause he has this real long talk to him out here. And then he has this like very, kind of charming loving moment and he's like you're the first person i've ever spoken to like this and then uh, i'm assuming this is guts uh, saying at that time he's shown before me as something beautiful noble larger than life but there seems to be like a love relationship developing there which i found very curious in the middle of all of this like you know i will i, I will say having like i said uh you know this has been a part of my life for well over decades it's funny or rather interesting to see the people that have tried to figure out this weird relationship between griffith and and guts and there's so many youtube channels with just like theories and and, and what the real definition is and i love it because in the end mira is the only one that knows so there is some kind I've, of I, that's not spoiling anything i'm just gonna say i mean you, you, there's it's a complexity to it and that's the beauty of this whole series you know, what, what is love and oh man it, it's, okay. it's amazing and a lot of the things carson you're identifying are, are are tropes that are existing in you know a lot of japanese pop culture at the time and uh you know it he, he's you got to think that the audience is both aware of the trope and also enjoying it being used in a different kind of way or a different kind of context um, you know, the the boy or man who's too pretty to be a boy or a man is like a very, very strongly uh, present Japanese trope across yes. genres and across uh, mediums and things. And, like that. and I'm not so well, well read in the manga. I mean, I've read a fair amount, but it's like, Sean, you're huge into the manga. Omar, you obviously are. I'm exploring it more now as like this new flavor, which I'm excited about. So I, I'm maybe not picking up on that stuff. So. Well, it's just, I mean, it's just interesting to me, you know, because because I, I think that the audience is aware of that as an existing thing. Uh, yes, and absolutely. Putting it in the context of these absolutely grotesque, uh, you know, biomorphic forms and battles of of uh, you know apocalyptic <laughs> battles and things like that is is the fresh. And, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it, it's become so important in the it's so tropey and so important in the culture that they when an anime adaptation is made, they have to hire the right voice actor because 
<laughs> it's interesting here um, <clears throat> for anybody that has you know, not familiar with the world of, of manga, you see a character like that and you immediately think, yeah, okay, well, that guy's obviously, you know, homosexual, like he's into men. But it's not always like that in, 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 in the manga. And I, I love that about it. So here in America, like, that's why a lot of people have problems with like English dubs, like the right person has to dub it because they miss the point sometimes. Right. Mm. And Griffith is one of those characters. Interesting. How how was the dub? Did they do a dub of? Um, I think the that, first I, I I like the, the the dub in English, and I don't really say that a lot. I'm not also not snooty about dub or sub, like some people aren't. Um, I watched it, of course, in Japanese originally. But uh, one time, um, I think I had a friend over, and he was like, "I don't want to read subtitles," so we watched it in English, and it's not bad. It was actually pretty good. I think they did. They they spent a lot of time uh, researching the work, and they know how important the work is, and if it's done right, they can make a lot of money selling these dvds <laughs> what 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 are they looking for in the voice actor that has to get it right when you say that sometimes it can be too feminine right does that make sense so that, like a voice actor so, can be too feminine and they almost miss the point of the of the character like, but they have to they have to run some border they don't try and get a very masculine guy to exactly, offset the, okay. exactly. So, it's, okay. so it's an interesting mix of both and i i'd love to i would love to see what a like a voice uh, caster, like uh, somebody in the voice casting industry would look for, in particularly for somebody like this. And, 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 you, and then you run the risk of butting up against old fan wounds, you know, like the Sailor Moon television adaptation where they actually just changed the sex of sex of the characters. characters. Yeah. So they didn't and, have to deal with. <laughs> obviously, this is a big, buff, like masculine, bad dude of a dude, but also, like, I saw it as like, <laughs> if batman was super pretty also like it's a very pretty batman character to me and in, in batman was super pretty might be my favorite statement with, with the Zen with the xenomorph uh torso <laughs> yeah but it is kind of like and it's almost like bondage batman so it's picking up on all of that aspect of batman like i don't know it looks more like how they had to do batman in the movies but this would have probably predated the movies but like where this obviously isn't like spandex over the character it's this built up costume almost um, I, I i do and have always loved the helmet though the hawk helmet yeah. is one of the oh. best things that it's cool it's so cool yeah Great. but Stands it out. makes it it's the hawk is also that works because it's so it's it can be such an aggressive animal but it is so effeminate in the curvatures and stuff, something you yeah. associate more with feminine forms. So I don't know. That's just something that, that continually struck me. Um, I'm glad to hear there's YouTube theories about it. So that's good. I, I, it's Tom, something I my, 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 my wife has watched a bunch. It's so funny. Like she has watched so many because she got into Berserk a couple of years ago when I was watching the movies um, and she got huge into it. And I, I always find it interesting when people discover the series and they build their own theories. Well, okay. So then I come out of that. They're having what I was seeing as maybe like a scorned lover thing. And that, that whole thing goes down and the big, this, uh, the, that is amazing. We'll talk about, I had tagged this, but when we talk about the tones, Sean, this, yeah. this page, I, I scanned that one. I didn't scan this because it's so big. People tend to, uh, tend to forget that there were always, you know, techniques that artists would use to before computers, right? It's crazy to think that there was a world uh, out there from, from uh, artists. I always look at the golden age art of uh, people's work and, and wonder, like, how were they able to do this without a computer? Well, it's crazy. I, I, I'm very excited example. about popping up the tutorial that I scanned as soon as we're we're ready for that. Yeah, we'll we'll out. get there in just a second because this stuff is beautiful and this was all hand done and man, what a spread! But this all closes up, um, and they kind of have like uh, you know these two characters that obviously have some complicated relationship, kind of have their moment, and then we come back to. <laughs> Like, yeah, again, the magic. gigantic sword with, like, right in his crotch and the girl hanging it, off of it, which I, to me is, like, reestablishing his heterosexuality after this big encounter with, like, what looked to me to be, like, a lover that he's struggling with his feelings for. Um, so I thought this image was funny, but also now thematically more relevant. 
So, so when I read this the first time, so a lot of this is not in the anime adaptations, both the movies and the TV show. Um, this to me, I like that you went that route. Uh, you go back to the penis, <laughs> which is nothing wrong with that. I get it. It's cool. Uh, but this to me was the moment that I realized, oh, his sword is not super sharp, which means that he has to deliver a specific kind of blow uh, to his enemies and with a bunch of strength and muscle behind it to to kill his enemies. And I thought, man, he is a lot more badass than I thought. Like, that is so cool. Yeah, she can grab it and it's it's making her hand bleed, but it obviously right. didn't just like- But it's not like slicing off. her fingers right off, right? Which means it's it's not sharp. Like, and I think some characters say that about it. That's not a sword. That's just like a hunk of steel or something like that. Yeah. Like they kind of reference to, that. Was it it's too big to be a sword? Oh, man, this panel. Okay, here you go, Omar. This is another one where... Okay, so you you you, you see this character throughout this whole uh, arc, uh, the Guardians of Desire arc. And, you know, he's you think you've got him figured out. He's this guy that's like, obviously banging demons and then killing them and and he's after a bunch of demons and he doesn't stop he's badass he's a manly dude and you end with this page this chapter with him and tears in his eyes and that says a lot about the character and, and the writer and the understanding of uh, humanity as a whole i think that while we see a lair we don't really get to know the man until he's alone. Like I think it's it's perfect. I love I love this panel, and uh, it's as heartbreaking. He, as he panel. walks away, right from just doing everything, away. right? Yeah, yeah. And that this is like I'm glad that I read it in the big because this is three volumes all at once, right? Yes, all three. And so I feel like by the end, I'm starting to get, okay, I see why Omar's put it, you know, because everything else you had on your top 10 list, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, that thing that's like the Fist of the North Star thing. Uh, so <laughs> this kind of nuance, yeah, that's um, kind of giving me a peek. And, and okay, then, and oh then, gosh, what? And then we get, um, I see it as a wild stylistic change. Yeah, that's he, he that's, went from all this heavy black and a ton of tone and big brushy strokes. Yeah, look to, at that. Did he to, take a break before that? I mean, I, and I don't know if this was on purpose. Um, and I don't know if he took a break because I don't think he was taking many breaks back then. Because this yeah. is a young guy that's like, I'm gonna get my work out there, yeah. I'm gonna get published. But yeah, he's working hard, he's also that, doing man. this as a flashback, right? So I think right. this was on purpose. Yeah. And it's called the the golden age, right? <laughs> oh my like, god! Yeah, yeah, the golden it... age, which is hilarious because this begins a flashback of <laughs> ten golden. volumes. Death. But it's it's called the golden age. So the artwork I was fascinated with even his his hatching style changes to this weird right. like hashtag style, which I actually like. I I was like, what in the world is he doing? not not as big of a fan of this hashtag style but it's much more open light line based art there's none of those big brushy except his hair those big brushy strokes like this that kind of goes away i mean there's some of it but um and then like oh my god it's fantastic like an insane page but it's all it's all hatching and line work look at look but holy crap all these little people the people the, the, the rooftops the shingles the bricks the the smoke yeah how like this is one of yeah this is one of those how pages like that's that's amazing i don't know if by now he had like a assistant i i, I don't know how it works in the world of manga. i don't know if you have to be a certain age i don't know if your book has to sell a certain amount of uh, of books a month i don't know but if he did this by himself I, I would be shocked if he didn't have um, a few assistants working. Like, with, maybe like a background assistant or something. I, I don't know. But well, man. even basic things like, you know, you can get somebody to rule up all your panel borders. You can get somebody to mm -hmm. lay down the tone, even if you're the one who etches it. Um, you know, uh, uh, there, there are things that somebody who, you know, can learn from watching you and it's essentially like an apprenticeship. I um, mean, I would be surprised if he didn't have two or three people working with him um, on a regular basis, but that doesn't, 
diminish, especially a scene like that where clearly all those marks on the you know are a, a single person's pen production. Um, yeah. So I just found that like in terms of tracking the style, um, whoever's doing it is impressive. But it seemed very different to me, uh, like almost jarringly so from all of the really dark, heavy toned. I mean, some of the hatching stuff is there, but compared to this, it almost felt like a different book. It, it reminds, I haven't really read it, but this looks more like the Vinland Saga stuff, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, like I can see that. NGR. And Vinland Saga gets, um, it gets compared to this a lot. It, okay. it, and probably because it's been released in America in hardcover form. Right. And, the, okay. and the art style is, you know, very reminiscent. But more open and, and line based. Um, this yes. was another this was another one I had tagged as like kind of a funny phallic image um, yeah. at first. But then with this last picture I have tagged, I wonder if it's more foreshadowing because the book ends on what yeah. looks like is leading up to a sexual assault on a child. Um, and uh, Sean, I think you just read the first one, so you didn't see this, but no, like this no. guy. This guy has, he, he, he basically like sells, he's like gets permission or something to come in. Yeah, he, he gives him some money, I think. Um, I don't, but he comes in. It's a, it's a rough world. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, a lot of people, this is a turnoff for a lot of people and I'm not, it 100 i i get it you know sexual assault on on children or, or anybody is is rough to read or watch right but i think yeah. one, one of the biggest arguments i see towards this book is that you know it's wrong they should, you know it, it's overused i think this is a title that it is for lack of better terms like it, it's used correctly right there's i if, if you're living in a world full of demons you're living in a world. I mean, this is reality and it's weird. And I think that's why to me, this is one of the most realist books that I've ever read. All these and characters seem real. Like, and these things, these horrible things happening build this character. When he makes decisions later on, you'll you'll see why he doesn't like being touched. Right. Why he that's, yeah, that's a thing. It, it's you holy crap. And that's one character. There's so many characters that he creates through this entire series but that's that very early in the book yeah. right that yeah don't touch and it, and it, it's it's when he's getting paid i think i, I can't uh, show I can't up remember. like really early on he says it, don't touch me like does. when this elf character touches him oh when puck chapter. touches him yeah. yeah and then later on it, it comes up again and, and so then I thought, okay, well, this is actually foreshadowing to that event. Absolutely. Where it is, it is like phallic, and you got you got these balls hanging down, but it's this big aggressive man, and it's this kid, and he's getting trained. You know, he's now like in the, in a this is guts as a kid, basically got adopted by a soldier, and he's just part of a Bino, yeah. Yeah, he's he, this guy. And he's he's part of this camp, and so he's just a kid thrown into this this man's world of rough and tumble. And yeah, of course it makes sense, like that. There's going to be and, and even his sword, right? Like hmm. they're like we don't have swords for kids, so he uses a regular sword. So he's used to a bigger sword. Yeah. Um, but this then, I was like, oh, okay. Then this sets up what I'm speculating is a here. complex relationship with this other male where he has some abuse in his past that that is showing up with this griffith character i think that's kind of at the end of the book what started out being me just kind of <laughs> making fun of like the 13 year old like dick jokes everywhere started to seem <laughs> really weighty like oh holy crap he's been setting up this the struggle so i'm i'm just very curious to see going forward i told i told tori i said i hope this i mean the series will never end now but i said i hope it, it i'm gonna ship these characters i'm gonna ship <laughs> i'm gonna ship griffith and guts and like hope that whatever complex relationship they have like that is the end of the series is him resolving i don't know what seems like it's gonna be kind of a lifelong struggle with the consequences of this and whatever happened between them so the, the book 
took all that and made it more complicated, which I found, you know, re really interesting. And I've got a whole bunch of them <laughs> more on the shelf to read, but. Oh, you're well, in for a treat, man. Yeah, I kind of wanted to do them maybe one at a time. We'll see how we do it. But. When we talked about uh, Monsters, Omar, we talked, uh, Barry Windsor Smith, Monsters, we talked a lot about genre and about how um, you you can use tropes in different ways. And I think it was interesting to, to read the first, you know, once again, I've only read the first 200 pages, but. Um, oh, he, uh, you're ahead of me. I just got the book in yesterday. Oh, okay. I haven't oh, read sorry. it yet. I've been looking forward to that book for years. I was, well. I was interested <laughs> to see how Berserk, um, the, the early portions of Berserk, um, you know, he, he really is just grabbing all the things around him and you know, he <clears throat> presents them in the in uh, the strong statements um, in a really interesting kind of uh, ways. Uh, uh, you know, the, using a trope is is powerful, especially if you can turn it in a kind of new way because you have all these other expectations that come along with the thing that people are, you know, used to seeing. The fact that this is in the context of like these combat comics means that when he brings in these emotional aspects to it, you know, it's a different kind of twist on the existing thing. Um, yeah, it, like kind of suckers you in with it a little bit, like pulls you in with the, the little 13 year old stuff and then gives you something heavier. It's cool. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> you get it. All right. So that's that's what you're preaching about. That's exactly what I'm preaching about. Um, I love uh, that you mentioned that he grabs all these different um, movies and, and books for inspiration. And then he himself becomes an inspiration to all these generation of video game makers and, mm -hmm. and manga call and American creators, American uh, Western Western style comics. You know, we all want to reach that level of badassness that is berserk. Well, then you synthesize it, right? You synthesize all of these different things and you find a, a greater underlying truth that's kind of writing below them all and pull that out. And that's that's what makes a really great piece of work in my mind is you take all of the stuff in the air and then you find out what the underlying thing that's leading to it all is. Uh, yeah. So let's, let's jump over then to all the scans. Cause they're yeah, will like, you pop up in the, that tutorial so we can use that as a sort of the, I'm going to, there's a couple that I wanted okay. just uh, to work our way towards that, but yeah, there, okay. so the, the scans here, uh, just because, Sean, I wanted to do the comparison scans yeah. that you had sent. Sean has the small volume, and mm -hmm. I scanned from the large. So this was an image where I thought, mm, that sucks. It got so poorly reproduced. And I can tell that the sword should look like this, basically. Um, and it reproduced so much darker. And there, there yeah. would be a, a big contrast pop here of the cape against the lighter rendering of the sword and so i thought man just from a compositional perspective that's a bummer so i think me and sean are going to take some time to recreate this panel like we normally do and then we'll try and tone it and stuff on the computer and maybe recoup what we think it was originally intended to look like so i thought those were two examples because this is one that reproduced to me beautifully yeah uh, and gives me a good hint on what the artwork actually was intended to look like. And then Sean, you had um, that same panel yeah. from the earlier volume and you can see already it's more open. Much more open, uh, which suggests to me that they didn't have a negative for um, those first few chapters. Maybe it's the first two chapters or something like that, which, you know, if you think about the fact that the, the, the book moved publishers um, it, it started off in a, in a magazine, I forgot the name of the, the magazine, but it basically it moved magazines in mid stride. Um, so they're working probably from a print scan uh, for this big volume for the first couple chapters. So they probably scanned this and then they're right. printing based on their scan of that. And you can right. see how it the contrast and I assume even this is probably not because it's so early on in the series, it's probably not the best reproduction it still looks gummed up and right. all the all the stuff we normally talk about so i thought those those two were interesting comparisons um and then you would also scan this one and that to me looked like they probably had the original on both ones right but um i actually felt like the this is the new volume it looked to me like the tone was cleaner 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's printed on a on a coated stock, right? And the, the one that I've got before is on an uncoated stock, and it's very small. The original Dark Horse printings were very small, and so you get a lot more slur. You can When you get really get up and in there on the dots, especially the tiny dots, you can see um, just the paper uh, causes the ink to expand a little bit and also to, um, you know, uh, shift a little bit. And so those are not perfectly uh, centered dots. So this would have been done with a uh, gradation tone uh, right on the edge of that. And then also it looks like there's some tone overlapping the hatching too. So there you can see the bleed that you're talking about, right? Sorry, sorry, Omar. I don't know if you know that we do this, but we... No, no. This is really interesting to me because one of the biggest... Uh, and I don't want to say complaints because there weren't a lot, but when I did an overview of the book, people were asking, why didn't they do glossy paper? Yeah. And the guy um, from Dark Horse, I don't know if he's still there or not, the, the, the editor uh, that was in charge of putting this book together, he said that they went with the paper stock they, that uh, was a uh, for the book this this matte paper that doesn't have really a finish to it because the artwork is presented the best in in this paper. And I thought that was a pretty interesting move because yeah, I'm usually with the Lux editions, you know, hardcovers they do glossy paper stuff. And you you know you can get a matte paper that has a really really good um, uh, finish to it that'll 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 take the ink a lot better, but. Um, uh, I don't that the original Dark Horse printings anyway are on the basic run of the mill um, yeah. web offset paper that just feels real rough to your hand. And that roughness is what causes the ink to expand and also causes the, you know, things to fill in and slur a little bit. So the edges of things get a little wobbly like that because it's filling in the tooth of the paper more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, different things like the direction of the press um, causes the dot to expand in the direction that the that the thing was moving you know it's just little uh physical as a physical object um, basically the smoother that the surface of the paper is the better that the blacks can reproduce and the, and the crisper the image is going to be but yeah uh, the, the first chapter or two definitely look like they're they're like second generation sources like down like there. even like this one section here of cross so this is the same section of cross hatching right here and right here I can tell because it's like here's that same mark down here. Right. Um, so looking at just how like thin and light this is compared to how gunk gunked up that is. Right. Um, it's interesting to see that in those productions, like in your smaller volume, that one page reproduced better, and on this situation, it reproduced worse. Yeah, because overall the printing is much worse on the small one, but then they they had a you know first generation sor source for the first chapter, which evidently they didn't. When they were doing the deluxe edition yeah so this image reproduces better it's interesting i i like seeing that i like having these multiple generations to see that on uh, i wish we could get the original art but like we've talked about with the manga there's just not it's not sold like the the american and european art so you can't go to like heritage and find scans of the original Art. This this is one of the panels I flagged for um, talking about the animation influence. Uh, this hair move right here, you basically have an implied uh, motion by having the 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 hair uh, move in a certain direction. This is a this is just a quintessential animation technique. Um, something that's very efficient to animate. You know, you can imagine it in slow motion. Um, her hair sort of shifting as everything else is kind of settling. And also the the use of the foreground, real strong foreground figure that's lit, um, and then you have the middle ground of these uh, ones coming towards you, and then you have the background figures which are pushed off by having the downward hatching lines. Um, all those the trees, things, yeah, uh, all those things in an animation production could very easily be animated with what's called parallax animation, which is each of those cells could be dragged to the left or right horizontally at a different mm -hmm. speed. And that speed um, could create the depth to the image. And so this is like a made for animation frame. This is one that, that just jumped, jumped right out at me. Even down That's interesting. I never would have thought of that. But yeah, you're right. This is on a plane. These are on a plane. And then, yeah. That's right. And then yeah. the, the back plane is moved very slowly. The middle plane is moved much faster. And then the, the foreground is not moved or is animated on top of. And then you have a very convincing, exciting, uh, image with essentially three still images 
uh, that, yeah. that company, Always, I think. Um, and it's funny that you say that because that panel right there of this particular scene mm -hmm. was animated in the uh, oh really what, what we don't talk about in the 2017 series uh here really in the house. That, that series <laughs> and, is horrible horrible, horrible they, series we don't we, like, do we don't even trick? we're not allowed to talk about it in this household um but it that panel looks familiar yeah did they do that trick of like one, two, three planes that he's talking about? I don't know if they did. Or, I don't think so. That 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 yeah. would have put some thought in love. That would be interesting. The project. I don't think they care. But that particular scene plays out in that 2017. Interesting. interesting. And the hair. You're right. Like it's this is moving this way, and it right. it shows like the stop. Right. right. Like there was motion happening this way, and then it stops. So like this versus this. Yep. And of this blowing back and not getting jerked forward. You got it. It was very cinematic. Yeah. At, see, I I mentioned this before we, we started recording, but I grew up without a TV. And, and <laughs> so, so sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's probably why I got into comics and spent all my time drawing. So it worked out. But yeah, it did. I, I would never see that probably looking at a picture like this because i don't really think in turn i mean obviously i've seen animated movies and stuff but it's not as big in my mind as it is for a lot of other people so that's like as soon as you say it i totally oh yeah but i would never catch that so that's cool all right the tone tutorial that sean scanned yeah. this is awesome yeah so this is a this is a uh, tutorial uh, that was made by uh, i'm gonna say his name incorrectly i'm apologize in advance unkaku koyama who was a uh, assistant on bastard which is a contemporary of Berserk, or made by a contemporary um, of uh, Mr. Mura. And um, it is uh, interesting because it shows you a lot of the things that you were uh, wondering about as you were looking at some of the images, uh, Carson. This is uh, layering screen tones together. And so each of these screen tones would have been created um, photographically. Um, and, uh, you know, it's essentially like a sticker. It's a piece of acetate that has printing on one side and adhesive on the other side. And uh, you're able to use a light board. Um, you know, you can make marks on the back of your artwork, and then you can place these pieces of tone on top of each other. And layering them was a known uh, thing that all of these assistants would have known how to do. Uh, people would have taught it to each other if you were an assistant who was going to go work for a mangaka. Uh, you know, this is a technique that you would have learned. And uh, right here, uh, he lays out different ways to layer tones and different effects that it gives you. It talks about perfect overlap. So, so here are the dots are offset just by a little bit. So it would be like, let me actually get my, I'm going to try and recreate some of this with the, the pen. So here it looks like they're doing just a slight offset. Right. So now my pen's not doing it just to make it look a little darker, right? Right. Uh, that's the idea. That's the idea is that the, the tone is overlapped on top of itself. And so that you've basically got a slightly darker density on the areas that they're overlapped in here. But without offset. pattern showing up here, you have like a pattern showing up more. Well, um, yeah. Uh, and depending on how you did it, that that pattern might be more or less, um, you know, uh, apparent. And then, uh, basically you can offset it in a different kind of way and get a different density and also a different sort of character to it too and uh this is a very interesting book um this series was put out in america in the early 2000s by a company called japanime graphic <laughs> uh, and uh and i think the books themselves are actually from the um late 80s or early 90s actually it must be from the early 90s because it has samples from um uh, from uh, some books that were from the late 80s in it. Uh, but uh, yeah, he talks about different ways to overlapping, and this was a known technique, and he ta even talks about in, uh, if you zoom out for a little bit here. Well, real quick, I want, so my yeah. assumption is what they're doing here is they're, they're getting um, put like that next to each other to make it thicker, and then this one, they're trying to evenly space them, like the dots are this far apart, but if you get two sheets, and line them up perfectly, you fill in every other, so you double the value. Right, you're doubling the value. Perfectly. So you had a 10% tone on top of a 10% tone, and then you've got a 20% approximately in the middle. Yeah, so that's interesting. Why didn't they just make different toned papers? Well, because, it, it, I mean, they did, but then you'd have to cut the edges to be perfectly aligned with each other. 
and uh, yeah that you know, oh okay i see yeah i get what you, you're talking about if you ever worked with actual tone i mean that's a huge pain in the ass to do that and, and not get a white like you'd have to cut this out and then cut another piece exactly here e and put exactly it over. Bas yeah, okay. basically impossible and it, it can it can make a weird visual interference on the line where they're overlapping each other yeah um, and then on the next page you can see he says, uh, often screen tones from different manufacturers will not overlap perfectly, as can be seen in an example on the left. While layering different brands of tones can create some interesting moiré patterns, be sure to use tones from the same manufacturer if you are trying to create perfect overlaps or full doubles. And a couple times in the book, he goes into moiré and times that you might actually want to use uh, moiré, specifically to create different types of lighting effects. Which um, is this, this look here, where because they don't line up, some points are more of the reinforced more of like this look and some of them are more of this look and so it creates these areas of like light bursts of light almost is right. what it looks like yeah and uh you can get a moiré pattern like that too by taking one overlapping piece of tone and slightly rotating it because then the two angles of the screen are against each other uh in the image and uh you know when i interviewed uh, gerhard um who was the background artist on cerebus I asked him about one particular sequence of uh, one of the books where he had water, light coming off of water, and he had used a two overlapping pieces of tone. And I said, so were you aware of any manga? Because I've never really seen this outside of, you know, any manga stuff. He's like, no. He's like, but if you've ever used used tone, you can't avoid it because you cut two pieces and you put it on. And you're like, oh, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, interesting. He saw this and like kind of filed it away in his bag of tricks. It's just interesting. People from, you know, different countries speaking different languages, 3,000 miles apart from each other could have essentially the same solution to something similar techniques that's so cool mm -hmm. because they have no, no I, awareness I, whatsoever i i well i go back to the whole how did they do this stuff before computer right. <laughs> like as now everybody's usually using the same kind of techniques right, right. the shortcuts and stuff yeah you okay. can do this dot tone pattern on the computer this so here's the bailet yeah, and, and this is done intentionally with uh, overlapping techniques to give a moiré pattern, a very, very interesting uh, pattern. And, uh, you know, I, I think it makes it, the image kind of feel uncanny. Um, I, I'm going to keep on bringing this up, uh, Omar, because you've, uh, of course, got that <laughs> <laughs> word okay. on my mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, this is, a, this is a very interesting use of the uh, double or triple overlapping uh, tones. And uh, I noticed that the, a lot of the biomorphic forms in the first two volumes, uh, Carson, had highlights like this. That one creature is bursting out of the other mouth is another great example of that. It's using Yeah, I, I have some of these. So I tried to line them up, and then we'll get to the cloud stuff. Um, so here's another example where he's obviously offsetting them then right. to get the two dots. And then they must be using one that has a gradient on it, or they're just doing a three dot. Because there's a gradient throughout here. Yeah, that that's a gradient a gradient tone on the left hand side. Do you see how some of those are half circles? That's a characteristic of the the of the gradating tone. So, it looks so like this is three, three different sheets? tones overlapping each other. You've got the base tone there that's etched, and then you've got a second one that's the exact same tone, and it's not only overlapping; it's also rotated just slightly. Um, I I do have to ask both of you, artistic world. How long would something like this take then? Because <laughs> well, this seems like a lot of work. Yeah. yeah now, this is a big center. I mean, this is the big reveal, right? So it is very important. Right. But there are a lot of pieces like this throughout the book. Oh, yeah. a ton. And that, that was one of the things I love the most that I, you know, I have a whole bunch of images because he's using this in so many different. And you just wait till we get to the clouds and you see them up close and you see what he's doing. It's like, what in the hell? Like, it's, yeah, it's I mean, nuts. It, 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 dep it depends. Uh, if, uh, if he had somebody who's assisting him um, do this, this could be a fairly efficient use of time. Um, because, you know, you think about it, you have an unpaid assistant who can do the thing that you want him to do. Or not unpaid, but, you know. Uh. But, uh, you, you can set down that first layer, um, or you can ask them to do the first layer, and then you etch it. So some some assistant sits there and puts the first layer down and then etches away or and then you go in and etch away the parts of it and you stick on the second layer. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it could be fairly efficient. But yeah, I mean, compared to to hatching everything by a pen, where each of those hatching lines is fairly unique to that artist, 
uh, if you watched any of the recreation videos that Carson and I have done, it's very hard to hatch like somebody else. Um, whereas a screen tone application, I mean, you you know, if you're you're managing somebody else doing it, I mean, that's a fairly efficient use of your time. Um, and like yeah, this, this is, is this is hours of labor. Uh, way you know, faster than stippling it by hand too. Like trying to get every dot in there by hand, which I I have to <laughs> yeah. Even with the shortcut, though, I have to give that. That's amazing. Oh no, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not calling it a shortcut. I I I think it's just efficient. You know. It, well, it, yeah. Maybe shortcut wasn't the right choice of words. Maybe with the easier way of doing. Yeah. It, it's, it's still, still incredibly crap. labor intensive. Yeah. No, you don't and just very... you don't just click on your Photoshop uh, gradation button and be done with it. That's not. This is this is this, this is, is before Photoshop. That's yeah. crazy. Now you have craft knives out, and you're. Each of those those white areas are are edited out with a craft knife. You're cutting back into it, and no, this is this is a very hands on, labor intensive technique, and and precision because yeah. you got to imagine this is stickers, see through stickers, and so the stickers to get these dots lined up like that, you're putting one sticker on top of another sticker, yeah. And then having to drop it and make sure it's right. And if not, then you're peeling it off and putting it back on. No, and then yeah. this is three stickers. This is one sticker, two sticker, and then a third sticker with the gradient. Yeah, that's uh, etched on the edge. Yeah, and we'll get to the et etching in, in a second too, because you have the page of that. Um, this is that panel with the light. So that intentional moiré pattern. Yeah, that's fantastic. Here. I love it. Beautiful. And that's that same technique that you're talking about there. Um, I found this one interesting. I scanned this one because this is a different tone paper that they must have had. Or two overlapping tone papers. That's that's very interesting. I don't know. I, I don't recognize that particular effect. But with this like staggered thick line drawn in and then a thin line and then a thick line, uh -huh. um, I found and that effect very odd. And he used it in a couple places. Um, that that one was so I'm kind of sad you don't know what that one is because that one I expected it when I got up close to be lines that are just slightly staggered from each other right like at five degree angles or less because that will create that similar look and you'll see that a lot in manga where they do their hatching at pretty similar angles and it gets that look a little bit yeah. but up close it's very like straight lines with a little bit of thickness dropping off yeah, the bottom. Sorry, I can't I can't help you with that one. I don't know. Okay. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's really interesting though. Yeah. Uh, there yeah, this is this one's blown out. Definitely blown out. And this is definitely down a generation from uh, the rest of the artwork in that section. Yeah, and this would have had dot pattern all over it and Across it's just the whole missing. Thing. Yeah. And the so the more ray is yeah. um, somebody not this particular picture, but somebody did this was a long time ago, whenever I did the first overview, send me like what the original artwork looked like in the magazine, not physically, but uh, they sent me an email. I thought that was really cool. They were like, you can tell. And a lot of this happens in the second deluxe edition. Not so much so later on where I guess the master started coming in. Right. But in the second edition, it's, it's lighter stuff like this. Like you see the missing details, even Does so much. So like the, the thick lines, like to, uh, to define the body some of them seem to like not even be there hmm. do, not very often they, yeah do, do those smaller versions have the same thing or is it only yes. in the deluxe yeah, yeah. It, it, it is it's the same thing throughout no it is that they're definitely just missing the you know this is just an extra step down from the other from the other um from the other pages in the sequence yeah that it's this i didn't even scan this one for you question because it looked exactly the same on the first uh, edition okay so, uh, yeah. yeah, but that one I saw and I thought, ugh, <laughs> and and the, it almost it overemphasizes the moray. It look makes them look a little snaky, which is appropriate. But um, it it works really well down here actually, where they are getting the etching. That extra blown out, I think, increases the noise down here. So it, I I kind of wonder if some of the digital artists now aren't purposely noising things up doing that to get an effect like that and then sure. going into a clean tone um but like trying to degrade an image like i don't know that's interesting because i could see an effect purposeful kind of when we were talking about the suge book too it's like all that noise made the swamp look swampier mm -hmm. um so that was interesting 
Okay, then this is where you're talking about etching. So, and Omar, there's some, you talk about how much work you had to have been going into. <laughs> some of these panels, like this beautiful cloud and Miura does a bunch of this in the first volume yeah, at least. Yeah. I don't know if he keeps doing it. Like I said, is. this is this is the uh, an assistant who worked uh, primarily on Bastard, and he was primarily the tone and environmental artist. So he would do, you know, there's a big fight happening, and he does the evocative storm happening. And uh, you know, this is an incredible image. It does it's not doesn't look great on a screen because of the Moire um, on a screen. Yeah, uh, but just the different tones that are on each cloud. That's yeah, crazy. And he breaks it down so you can actually see. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> and you can see what how much is pen and ink, which is almost none. <laughs> none, right? And he's and got then, this then a, so pen and ink, a layer of tone. Yep, and uh, and uh, he's etched out like sort of a global etching for the first one. Um, will you go back to that same? Um, yeah, and and then down one, he's got a second layer of tone on top of uh, that image. Will you go down to the to the next? Uh, this image here uh yeah and you can see he's uh basically etched in with a different you know technique and so this is all one sheet of tone okay yeah so one sheet of tone two layers of etching to get the initial like cloud burst right and then he goes in with the second layer of tone up on the upper right there and really goes nuts with the overlapping and building up the the density uh, there and even though it's a reduction on a photocopier, you can still see the sort of global areas. And then, I mean, just quite the and incredible. etches again. And then he does a third tone, right? Which he says, um, this image has become um, much darker with the addition of the third layer. It may not look good <laughs> printed in a manga magazine. <laughs> Might be best to revert to. And you can see, I mean, it must be a real struggle. You imagine a team of people work on an uh, on a book and you put it out and you get the the magazine back and it looks like shit you know um it, it it's got to be a, a very interesting balance to always be thinking about reproduction how does this look when it comes back you know well um, and that's why i you know we're such nerds about it because i love this, I, this awesome. i've been i've been doing art that's and you know the what we were talking about on Strange Death of Alex Raymond, it's not the tones, but it was the cross hatching and the fine hatch lines and the difficulty in reproduction and and how frustrating it is as an artist when you want to do something that's beautiful like this, but you know it's gonna it's gonna print all kind of gummed up and garbage. And then do you just do it for yourself or you do you learn some other technique or you, you know now we're getting to the now we're getting to the point where we can reprint it successfully but it's a bit of a bummer when someone like miura did this and just we don't have the original art we just have the negatives and and so it will never be reprinted in all its full glory it, it's just kind of sad um, yeah it, it helps that the you know it seems like most of the reproduction stuff is really just on the earlier the earliest issues but uh yeah it got better quick um but the etching that you're talking about so this also shows once you have the dot tone, um, people are taking a razor blade and I can, I can pretty much recreate it here on Photoshop. They're just scratching away at the dot tone. So let's just, I'll zoom in on the dot tone. I love that you have this book. <laughs> like, uh, it brings back a lot of memories of, of having, and I didn't know it was written by the, one of the uh, bastards, uh, assistants. Yeah. He's you know, there's a... a book that never finished. Yeah, I know. Gosh, I love that stuff. All the yeah. good stuff, right? Vagabond. I, Omar, I know you love Vagabond. Oh, Vagabond. Oh, you man. Want to hide I, I get Is it. it. I get uh, it. But come on, man. But Vagabond we need these story. big hardcover re reprints of Vagabond, um, too, right? Oh, dude, uh, right? Come on. We, we do have the Viz Big Editions. They're huge and beautiful, but completely, some of those are out of printing. I mean, manga goes out of print. I always tell my viewers, I'm like, yeah. You guys think it's bad when an omnibus goes out of print when a single volume of like volume 23 of a 40 volume series goes out of print oh it gets crazy yeah yeah i know. wanted to start getting those viz big and i saw like five nine and twelve are out of print and it's like well i'm not gonna start buying these books it's that's silly the economics of it are really difficult from the publishing standpoint i mean uh because 
you know, maintaining 16 books or something is a very different thing than maintaining four or five uh, or 10 books. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It takes absolutely. you the cost of a car or a small home to print, pay for your print run and you might not and, sell it out for two or three years. On, on top of that, you're dealing with manga too, which already you already have a license for and sometimes right. the license is, is lost or doesn't need yeah. to be, um, doesn't get Fine picked night. up. Uh, gentlemen, on that note, I do have to go. Yeah. Um, yeah thanks for joining us man i appreciate it i want to thank you guys for having me this is really cool so i'll go back and watch this Um, well i thank you we really appreciate your expertise and and thank you for your amazing channel and uh you know i thank you guys for uh even thinking of me and uh having me on this was a lot of fun and educational for for me (laughs) this is really cool i love to look at the talk about these kind of things and, and you guys break it down beautifully so i appreciate that well, thank you, and uh, thanks for bringing this book to our attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting them in my hands as soon as uh, they're back in print. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the good thing is that these are evergreen. Dark Horse has decided to keep these always in print, so you just have to wait just a little bit for, I guess, Amazon or other places to get them. But yeah, you gentlemen have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too, Omar. Thanks. Omar, thank Take you very much. much. Bye, guys. So. Uh, Sean, the, we, we've talked about these etching techniques before. Um, the other one you talked about is the eraser technique. This is right. cool, though, because we have the tone here and then drawing. Oh, no. Damn it. Photoshop froze up on. I dragged it around too much. Um, let's see. That page is going to freeze. Let me reload that page. Uh, well, we can just do it on some of this tone here. Since we have the tone, yeah. the, the etching that they're talking about is taking the a razor blade and you're basically just scratching the sticker off right and and the thing is that the 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 angle that you're etching has a lot to do how successful you're going to be has a lot to do with the angle of the tone and so it's not like you could just freehand on top of it i mean you can but um you know certain angles are going to be more dramatic than others given how much of the tone that they're piercing or you know covering And then the other technique that you've talked about before is eraser. So Mm -hmm. taking an eraser and that's going to leave a softer edge to it. Yeah. Specifically like a sand eraser. um, Something, something that, uh, you know, it's basically got grit. uh, And that basically leaves an effect like this. Right. It's not going to reproduce like that, but, but the, when photographed or when adjusted for line art, basically you're going to get a more of a feathered kind of edge to it. So each of those areas there that are sort of half and half right now would be a smaller dot um, after it's been, you know, adjusted to be line art. And, and he's definitely using, so we'll go back then to um, some of the Berserk scans. You scanned this one in. Yeah. And there's a lot of that going on in there. Really beautiful. And it, this is one of those things where it reproduces all right, I think, but yeah. it's it still looks pretty gummed up. Like it could be as beautiful as that, <laughs> right? And, and it, it very likely was. I'm scan. I scanned it from that very small, like I said, volume printed on fairly terrible paper. Um, I don't know how it looks on the omnibus edition and whether they. Have I I, I scanned a different. I think this is a different page, but similar effect. Intentional yeah. moiré on the trees there, which gives it a feeling of a uh, fog. And well, light see, that was something I wondered about. That looked on. Oh yeah, that was something that felt funny to me. Um, it looked too patterned for fog. I thought that was maybe an accident of printing, but that, that's interesting. Though it does some stuff I wanted to talk to you about is how much of this do you think was intentional? Like on the baylit thing, I thought some of those effects were weird. Um, I guess for how surreal that object is supposed to be, yeah, that kind of works. But I think it's very I, fitting. I, I'm I curious because some of it, like here, it doesn't look so good to me. Whereas on that window scene, it looks great. Right. Um, but yeah, I was so impressed by this stuff. So you can see in the deluxe edition, the printing is like the that effect comes out about the same mm-hmm. as how it is in your smaller version. Um, but it does lead to some really, it's still beautiful. It's just in, in the print, I do feel it looks a little clumsy. I think like if he does this in later volumes, it's probably going to look awesome, you know, 
Uh, yeah, there's a lot of judgments to make on something like that because the the more overt effects like that were very novel at the time. And now, I mean, you know, if you, if your association of Moire is a print mistake, um, you know, this, yeah, this was a to very me, novel it looks effect. like a mistake. Right. Yeah, it looks like a mistake. Um, this stuff I thought was like you wouldn't have seen this because it's later after they go into that other reality. But exactly. look at that there. Yeah, like the whole drawing is entirely yeah. etched and then in layers right like etched in layers like they're putting a layer down etching and then putting a layer down and etching again like you have to you have to it's like a chess game you got to be three or four steps ahead to pull that off right uh and we're it, we're definitely not recreating one of these <laughs> and you're never going to see something like this again because all of this the tone paper is gone um you know this is going to be like like i said like a mesotint People are gonna look at a mesotent and say, "Well, what is that?" Well, no, they make these papers now. I think. I think it's like. Uh, I think it's kind of like Polaroids. They're coming back. Hmm. I know, like uh, the guys on Cartoonist Kayfabe use a lot of this stuff, and they use the physical stuff. I don't know if they got new old stock kind of thing, like you yeah. did, you know, on the pins where you're finding it online. I think. I think it is becoming available again. Uh, but a lot of people are recreating these looks digitally, too. Um, yeah, here's another. You were talking about the guy with the monster coming yeah. out of his mouth. 100% intentional use of Moire. And then uh, instead of etching, I think he's painting on top of it with whiteout. I think you're right. You know, to get and there's this some, stuff. There's some, probably some etching as well, if you look at the forms that have, yeah, right there. Yeah. And another cheek as well. But this was another one where I thought it looked a little too oddly like 1990s. You would get those printouts on the computer where they would print, you would like make an image out of just the commands on the keyboard right. and pe people do those. I thought, so in some Ask places you. I thought it looked weird. Yeah. Ask but your... then he goes to this effect. Will you zoom right is, in on that? It's just like noise tone piled on yeah. top of each other. Yeah, what Gerhard calls scribble tone, and uh, yeah, it's used. It's it's being used in like two or three layers, and uh, yeah, it's hard to make that reproduce well because the dense once the density gets higher, um, it it's acted on more extremely by the fill in. So I wouldn't be surprised if he saw this in in the monthly magazine and said, "Well, not going to do that." It's cool. Yeah, looking. and very quickly you get okay. I'm putting two layers. Right. Because that reproduces, and then this one had like different two sizes different, and two different types of tone so one of those they're both they're both um yeah they're, they're both a script a type of scribble tone but they're different ones at different size different densities like bigger dot and smaller dot uh -huh. so yeah i found that interesting because he is very quickly adapting especially on this character the baron very quickly adapting how he deals with the tone and then this is what I was talking about. He'll do even, he's got, I mean, this is like that noise tone with, I don't even know, like what, what is this? How is he doing that? Yeah. <laughs> is that a lot of just etching out? Like That's what it looks like. It looks like it's two or three layers of the same de or different densities of noise tone. Like, and, and then etch, 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 and then do it again and etch, etch. I mean, you're right. erasing out so much of the tone at that point. And then one of them, it looks like it's a directional tone. Do you see? I, mean, I might be wrong about that, but it almost looks like. It's, it's these got... weird bursts of like, right. they're all about the same length. I don't know. It's a very weird look. Um, when you when you look back at it, it almost looks like he got ink on a piece of burlap and squished it on there. Mm -hmm. Um so I think it's really weird too that like he'll just switch between the techniques. So he's created this looks more like textural, and mm -hmm. this just looks more like purely value, value rendering. Yeah, yeah. and he he'll flip flop between them, um, which to my it's very interesting, but to my eyes like a little jumpy. But I really like this sense of experimentation that's going on yeah. throughout all of those sequences. Um, and then, okay, this is the other thing that we brought up that I, I wanted to get to. We were asking Omar, were these originally in color? I was, I was glad to hear that they were. 
is right. cool that he knew that. So this would have been a color image that right. was then converted to black and white. And then can you explain the half toning? Yeah. So depending on how um, they did it, uh, they might. So, so first off, when any time that you're taking a color image and you're just immediately converting it to a grayscale image, um, you're it's a thing that's fraught with peril because as a painter, you know, you might be painting with colors being your primary method of contrast, or you might be painting with uh, value being your primary method of contrast. Uh, and if you happen to have mainly used color as your primary method of contrast, if you convert that to grayscale and the colors are relatively, relatively the same value, you can end up with a muddy image as a result of that. I got um, a great example of that because I have to talk about this in my, my drawing classes. Um, when we're drawing a color setup, let's see if I have the example. When you're drawing a color setup, uh, but say you have like a really bright blue, it really freaks a lot of the students out. Here we go, perfect. Um, we have this bright yellow and this pretty bright blue yeah. and the red. If I just straight up convert it, yeah, this is a perfect example, right? The yep. compositional uh, <laughs> impact of that yellow and the blue goes away. It, it totally changes the focal point shift and also the warmth of this thing back here. Will you undo that uh, and redo it a couple times? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So Shoot. look at also the warmth of this. It looks darker to me. Right. When you convert it, it looks the same value. And so this is a much more impactful part of this composition too. It frames his head in a way it doesn't. And then just the triangle of the intense colors here, uh, as soon as you turn it to the the black and white, oops. Let's hit, uh, oh yeah, never mind, I forgot that you did. All of those compositional strengths go away. I mean, this still kind of frames it, but not as intense. The triangle is not there as intense. Yeah, and so um, this would have been addressed if you had an image you really, really cared about um, in the photographic age, pre-digital age, this would have been addressed by using filters. So what you could have done is you could have used um, uh, different filters that would basically subtract out certain colors uh, when you were re-photographing it to process it into a grayscale image. Um, you know, you could slap a yellow filter on there and make that yellow pop out to white instead. Yeah, um, so that's something that I'm always telling my students. You have to make the decision. Do you want to make a direct one-to-one -one translation? What would this look like if it was in black and white? Or do you want to preserve the compositional pop? So the compositional right. pop, you have to artificially, you know, you would basically do this. And this is the, what the filters you're talking about would be doing, right? Yeah. They would be intentionally brightening this area up. And even the blue, you'd have to... That's right. Like we tend to think of blue as dark, but you, you could have a really intense blue that's very dark. And that's a real, real trouble for students too. So right. you have like a dark blue, but it's real brilliant. How do you, how do you translate that in the black and white? Like you, you, you lose the impact. And, and so um, in Photoshop, you have a wonderful, wonderful tool. I mean, I just can't even believe that this is the, that we live in the age that we do, but you can go to image um, adjustments, uh, black and white filter. And this essentially allows you to have unlimited time in a fantastic dark room with as many filters as you want. Um, you can take each of the different things that Photoshop identifies as the prime, you know, the primary and secondary colors, and you can adjust the density of each one of those elements um, to try to get the same type of compositional pop or intention that you want. Yeah, so you image. can see I'm recreating. I'm I'm low. I'm I'm intensifying the whites on the yellow. Now the only problem with this is, it's there's a lot of yellow in that image, so it's brightening up a lot of stuff. So you might want to isolate. Just if I all I wanted to affect was the collar, right? Um, I would want to isolate that first and just adjust that. But this this is something we'll actually talk about at some point when we're recreating artwork too, because when I was recreating things in Strange Death, of Alex Raymond. Dave would oftentimes send me scan of color comic books right. and I'd want to get back to the line art. And I saw Sean using this for something else and then I would go and strip out all the color right. and that made my job easier. So that is, that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, 
it's a really fascinating problem to solve when you're drawing, especially if you're drawing like with pencils or something and you're doing a more shaded look. It's a really fascinating problem um, trying to translate brilliance into uh, uh, just value, value, light or dark value, because there's no no good answer. It's just what looks best for your composition. Well, um, and that's that's one of the reasons that the, the Berserk, uh, it, I was bringing up the color things is because, you know, they would reward, the magazines would reward the artists for their good performance by giving them a color feature for that month or a portion of it for color. But of course, it's dooming them in terms of the production for the uh, future printing, because unless the printer is ready, ready to pony up for color in the collected volume, um, they're going to have these muddy looking inserts throughout their uh, story. So, you know, the real solution to it is that if the artist is still alive, I think to work with the artist and their team to go back to the color and try to create a grayscale one that accurately represents the original artwork. But in this case, um, it looked to me like maybe they only had production negatives of it. Um, and so these are essentially like the just straight from whatever initial photographic conversion was done. And Instead then of on top of that, they run the halftone process, which is converting it into the dots. Right, exactly. Um, and in this case, they're not overlaying all the stickers we're talking about. No. It's it's a photographic An automatic process. process done at the printer and can be done to varying qualities. <laughs> so I wanted to do that then. I had this, but since we've got we've got Bob Odenkirk up here, we can do it to this. So here's a, well, no, let's use this because it's a higher resolution scan. So this is um, when we had talked about the uh, the X-Men Artist Edition, we were looking at this image, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's do the Bob Odenkirk, because I thought yeah. that was a bigger scan. So first off, we have the trouble of what we just talked about, which is converting them into black and white. And then that's a, you know, a pixelated image at this point, but each pixel is filled in still with a different level of gray. When we're going to print in black and white, we don't have color. You have to convert that entirely to black ink marks, correct? Yes. And so on, now it's on Photoshop. It's really easy. We'll go to bitmap and halftone screen. Uh -huh. And make the output resolution higher too, so we can see the dots nice and round. Maybe make uh, 1,200 like, pixels per inch or something. OK. And then anything on frequency or? Uh, whatever you want. Yeah. So the angle is the, the primary angle that the, that the screen is done. All this is done automatically these days by the printers, what's called the raster image processor. And depending on the type of paper, they can do different things. But the frequency is um, basically how dense it is. So the higher the frequency that you make, the more dot lines worth of dots there's going to be per inch of printed. Image. We'll do it twice with different. Yeah. So there, there's not particularly, there's not a lot of dots. Yeah, let's zoom in and take a look at what the, and so you can see everything is essentially made up of small variations of a circle. And when the transition, in those transition areas, the circle turns into a more squarish shape. And then when you're trying to get the blacks, the circles, the the white part instead of the black part all of a sudden. Right. Yeah. But when you zoom out, well, no, that's going to look terrible on the computer. But if you saw that from far away, it resolves into a pretty decent yes. picture. Um, OK, we're going to go. Let's go back and we'll increase the. Keep that. And then we're going to increase. I'm going to go ahead and put 90 degrees because that's going to sure. run it straight up and down on the grid. Yeah. And then we'll put frequency like 100 or something. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a higher resolution image. Right. And for a printer, was... a printer was going to avoid doing this at such a high resolution. And the reason for that is because um, they're going to get more fill in. Essentially, the smaller you make those dots, the more prone the image is to filling in on the press. Which we've looked at in other right. instances of looking at people using the the dot tone stuff is that right. when it scanned and then printed this, this, uh, what's that stuff called? The letter tone. Is that what it's called? Uh -huh. Those dots, yep. the, the sheets of dots. Yeah. The letter tone when it scanned our image and then printed it, it fills in in the same way. 
Right. But now with the better printing technology, like you'd be able to get an image like this to reproduce pretty, pretty good, right? What, yeah. what would your what would your limit be? Oh, it depends on the on the paper. And you know, normally you don't unless you're normally unless you're using archival materials where you have a previously existing half tone screen, you let the printer take care of it. But you can tell them things like use the tightest screen possible or things like that. And um, it depends on the paper. It depends on the press that they're running it on. Um, and, uh, you know, paper manufacturers present different standards to the printer, too. OK. I don't know why like, it's getting dark there for a second. This this I had set it at 300 instead of 1200 dots per inch. So you can see it can't use circles at that low resolution. So it's got to use got crosses. Like crosses. This yeah. is the type of look I was saying that I thought some of his his uh, toning that he was doing in Berserk looked like this old printer printout stuff to me where it was crosses because the way he was lining up the dots, Offset. they made these cross patterns. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that's weird. It looks like the old... Um, the old inkjet printers, like when I was in junior high and they'd come out like on a roll and it had like the little paper that you'd have to rip off on the side that had the holes in it. And right. it, it had that plotter paper look to it. Um, so I, yeah, that's why I thought that bail it thing was bizarre looking to me. It had that, that look to it. Um, so yeah, I, I love in this book how much experimentation he was doing with all of those tones. Um, I love that it gave us a chance to talk about this because it shows how you're taking uh, and the, the, in Blade of the Immortal if we ever talk about yeah. that it's the same thing because he does so many images in pencil right up against ink drawings um, and you have to figure out a way to print them with the same like dots and lines that you would anything else right you can't print the right. gray so I think this book gave us a really interesting example of yeah a painting having to be reproduced almost using the same techniques that then He's purposely using. Uh, no one's touching <laughs> We got kids. <laughs> we do. Kids in undies. That's okay. I got one now too. I've got one for the next <laughs> month, month and a half or so. Uh, he's a little older, but he may still come in as Miles Morales undies at some point. <laughs> um. Anyways, yeah, like this has been a fascinating talk. We've been going on forever. So yeah. you want to yeah, wanna call this one a day? Uh, just, to, go ahead. just to remind everyone, um, we, have, we have our book, The Strange Death of Alex Raymond. It's coming out at the end of July, beginning of August. Um, you should be able to order it from your local comic shop. You should be able to get it from your local bookstore or pre-order pre it on Amazon, um, you know, it's Sean's expert that we're expertise that we're using in printing has made this one of the most beautifully printed books I've I've seen. It's it's going to be a doozy, and uh, it's going to be available very soon, and uh, we should have a solid release date. Thank you. Know. <laughs> All uh, right. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, Sean. We'll see. Yeah, you too. Later.